This meeting is being recorded. <clears throat> David, how have you been? I'm all right. Now that I'm here, I'm going to leave. <laughs> okay, very good. I'll be, I'll, I'll be right. I, I want to visit the restroom before we, we begin, so I will be right back. Yeah, but I'm right. looking forward to uh, to joining. All right, looking our forward discussions. to having you. Yeah, uh, see you in a sh in a minute. In just. Excellent. So yeah. FYI, I have discovered that um, uh, the communications of the ACM, which is, I, I would say, one of the most important academic computing, uh, well, software journals. Yeah. Um, uh, basically, in their July edition, they have an article viewpoint. It's a viewpoint, but, you know, why computing pro computing students should contribute to open source software projects. Oh, wow. Who wrote that? Uh, uh, Diomedes uh, Spinellis. Uh, my apologies if I'm mispronouncing. No, I don't know him, but um, yeah, I use open source in all my classes. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I um, for one of my uh, uh, classes, they have a project. They're not required to release as open source. However, uh, most of them just make a game and whatever, but a couple say, I don't want to make a game. I want to change the world or improve it in some way and say, fine, uh, you can have a do a special project, but you got to release this open source because it's going to take me more time to review that. And if, you're gonna, if I'm going to put in that time, I want to help the world too, yeah. <laughs> not just your company. Yeah. yeah. Some, oh, some, some folks want to just, you know, hey, I'm going to write some software for my company. Well, first of all, I probably won't be allowed to see it. And second of all, why am I spending that extra time? Yeah. So, yeah. So we're by the, for folks who are joining us, uh, just FYI, um, in the communications of the ACM, which is a uh, very important uh, academic uh, software journal, uh, they have a viewpoint article, why computing students should contribute to open source software projects. So, I, I guess I, you know, I can put in a link, but I think if you're not an ACM member, you don't actually get to read it. But you know, I am. So, like, if you put in the link, I can. I will in. put in a link. I can. I can make Focus it available. Was on students versus other demographics. I'm sorry. If you said the focus was on students, why students? That's right. Okay. Uh, because that's well, that's what the person. I don't. I. I cannot speak for why they chose to write an write an article. <laughs> I, yeah. I. I mean. I. I. I, sus, I suspect it's. It's simply because computer. I mean, computer science education is, as a professor of computer science, it's not that great. Um, and I think actually open source. So, like I use it a lot in my classes. I think it makes it better because it connects the work that is sometimes pedantic and repetitive to something that students can connect to, uh, especially if you're working with projects that have some kind of social good as a component. Um, my experience is that, that that connects more than, here's another assignment to show me your data structure algorithm. Uh, 
I, 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 I think there's a long list of, I, I, there's a long list of reasons uh, to be involved in open source projects. Uh, to be honest, one of the main ones, I think more broadly is connection to reality. Um, I, I, oh, I, 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 that's I'm crazy quite, talk right there. I don't know. Why uh, would, oh my why goodness. Do that. Um, I, I can actually speak, uh, I'm going to name names and, and tell all, uh, but uh, th there was a, after the Unix source code stopped being so widely available, there was a series of many, many years where the operating system research community couldn't see and certainly couldn't publish code. And increasingly, uh, they focused on stuff that was frankly not all that important. This is a time when you would find um, hundreds of articles about scheduling algorithms. Um, and while they're important, 99.9% .9 of the time they're not important. And they couldn't talk about the stuff that was actually important because the academics had no idea. They couldn't see what actual systems look like. And then when the Linux kernel and to a lesser extent the BSDs became available, all of a sudden, <gasps> They could talk about real world things and, yeah and and it it really there there were some really bizarre things that that got into fads because of their disconnect with what was actually important and you can see this over and over again yeah uh, that's i mean i know that i was i inserted myself into um some Linux kernel security stuff between my alma mater, the University of Minnesota, and the LF recently, very quietly in the background. <laughs> well, you know, you, you will encounter many personalities with many thoughts, but at least you know that what, when they produce the final code, it's real, people yeah. are going to use it. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think, yeah, and I think, I think the, um, you had a lot of well-meaning people who just effed up at the University of Minnesota. And it, I think I think what happens when in some situations where you try to introduce students to the real world is they don't understand the context at all um, because it's so new to them. Um, yeah, so uh, just, although it's not, it's not really public, there's, there's no reason I need to hide it. It's just not, uh, I actually wrote the Linux Foundation response to the University of Minnesota. Good. Uh, I, I wrote the primary, I mean, people edited, uh, you know, Mike Dolan signed it and sent it to them. Um, I mean, he, he more than signed, he actually had some great comments. Um, if you get involved in research, particularly experimentation, may I urge you to read the Menlo report? It is thin, thin, thin. It's very few pages, but it basically, um, it's August 2012, the ethical principles guiding information and communications technology research. So basically don't experiment on people without their permission, yeah. et cetera. Right. No. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but it doesn't seem like rocket science. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't. It it, it doesn't. But I think, uh, yeah, I th I think you had a really we good. Link to that in the chat as well. Yeah. Uh, Menlo report. Uh, yeah. Now I mean, it, there is a URL for this stuff. So let's see here. Menlo report. How do you uh, address the deceptive studies that needs to be done in this context? I'm sorry. So I'm thinking of it in terms of a deceptive study, like where you don't tell the participant what you're doing, otherwise how they are going, to, otherwise the uh, like maintainer will be cautious of the things they are doing. Yeah. Uh, that's true. They might be more cautious. Too bad. You still have to conduct your experiments ethically. Yeah. Um, and if you're curious why, and, and you may smile, uh, but in the U.S., I, I, my apologies, I don't know where you, where you are living, uh, but in the U.S., there have been some extremely harmful uh, experiments done on people in the U.S., particularly uh, medical communities in the past. Uh, there were a number of men who were in, in, intentionally infected with a venereal disease and left untreated. Uh, the there were some really Tuskegee experiments. Yeah. yeah. So, so there, there have been some extremely awful things that have been done in the name of science and uh, you know, there has to be limits to it. And so, you know, people have studied this. There are, you know, 
there are and and I, if you get money in the U.S., you're actually required by the federal funding to obey certain rules that are based on on that. And it's there's actually a more general report the fund, mineral the mineral report specifically on security. There's a more general uh, report, uh, the Belmont report, which is more general exper mm -hmm. ethics and scientific experiments. So when when humans are involved, so right. yeah. Anyway, I put a I put a. I put a Google link to, uh, I downloaded a cap using my ACM credentials of the PDF and put it in my Google Drive and put a link in the agenda if anybody wants the original PDF of that article that you are referencing. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, um, hmm, I don't know about the copyright issues on that. So it's uh, very, it, it's, um, as an academic, I have what's called fair use. I, no, I, that's fair, fair use is a generic legal issue. That doesn't okay. mean academics are vulnerable to the requirements of copyright law. So I, uh, I just be, be cautious when you do that. I don't know. I, I'm not a lawyer, but you have to be a little cautious about that. Anyway, Gary on. Yeah, no, I am. Um, well, <laughs> let's not talk about me. Although okay. my, pers my personal story involves building a substantial system for a major academic publisher at one point. And I can promise you, they have way too much of our money. <laughs> and, and so now that now that I can appreciate, I so, taunt, I tend to taunt them um, with with my use of links to my own articles that they say I'm not supposed to post, and I'm just basically daring them to come after me. If if they're the, your own articles, generally you're allowed to by most of the. Uh, yeah. But anyway, let, right, let's so, get back. Let's get back to the topic okay. of this meeting. So MVP, I think we did. It looks like some substantial work. I just put the meeting minutes in the notes if people wouldn't mind adding their name. Um, I did see some substantial progress. Thank you, Sophia, and those who were able to be here last week or two weeks okay, ago. A lot of that was Vinod. So thank you, Vinod. Um, and I'm just going to share <laughs> in the in the link this is i think if i'm if i click through all of them i think this one about infra uh, about uh, upstream code dependencies is the one that received the most attention it looks the most well developed is that a good yes. guess on my part yeah uh, well that's the one that was nearly done when we looked at it and i think vinod spent some time cleaning up the yes. last few things that was dependency metric i cleaned everything over there we just need to like if it is okay then i'll create a pull request and create a release okay do awesome. we want to take five minutes and just quickly review it before uh, we ask Fanad to do that or or do you think it's like super ready to go we should just have Fanad. i would repeat. say just give it a read if it is good i'll then follow the process of release yeah what we've done in other working groups recently is we recognize there are maybe some questions and we just throw it into the release period to see if those questions are asked. Um, if we feel good about the metric, then um, we let it out uh, and let the review process do its job. So, all right, I'll set, set a five minute timer in my head. It's 2.11 and I'll read it and it's, I'm going to do a quick copy of what we discussed a moment ago, just so that uh, it's not lost. Good. Can I ask, what is the difference between an execution dependency and a language runtime dependency conceptually? I should know this, but I'm a, a little uncertain. It looks like, so execution dependency is defining build, test, and runtime dependencies yes. as separate concepts, sort of conceptually. And then the language runtime dependencies are going into the detail of that specific type of dependency, which has some important differences from development rep dependencies. 
Yeah, and I would it's I would assume that runtime, for example, is a subset of all the execution dependencies, say during um, you know during production use. And it is the, it is listed that way. Um, okay, where, where are you looking here? I am right here. Where, okay. And I'm looking, and I'm I was looking at this, and I do see runtime dependency listed here. Um, Yeah, transitive is more than second order. It's the of later orders. So you can have second, third, and so on. I'm channeling Kate Stewart right now. Okay, I have redefined transitive to include all the other orders, not just, you know, not just second order, because it's not just second order. Right. Yeah, I think that. On that edit. Say that again, Sophia. I, I agree with that. Thanks for changing it. Yeah, so execution dependencies are just, <laughs> excuse me. Bless you. Apparently you have uh, pollen in your area. It's true. Um, it'll be there tomorrow too. Yeah. I don't fully understand language built in libraries in count. <laughs> um, where are you? Okay. Um, let's see here. I understand them. Uh, okay. Pretty much every <laughs> practically every program. I'm, I'm sure you can find an exception, but in general, Almost every language I can think of has some built-in libraries where you, the syntax and everything else that you use to call them is no different oh, from oh. a third party, no, but yes. it comes with it. For example, sys you, the OS stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now. I no, not it. Nece not necessarily OS. It's part of the language. Right. Um, so, for example, RE is a package within Python. When you install Python, you get RE. If you import RE, it doesn't need to, you don't need to install any third party libraries. It's just part of the set. Uh, it's true for C also. Uh, C includes standard IO, which, um, you know, those are built in libraries and they're typically implemented separately, sort of, but, you know, um, but you, you know, the syntax is no different than anything else, but uh, you don't have to install anything separate. Um, so uh, this could, so let me ask, and I know we've discussed this before, but really this is so, so um, inventory of the specific major and minor release, release of the language will, mm -hmm. will give us that dependency. Um, and, uh, you know, so for example, I've had an issue recently with some of the Augur notebooks between Python minor releases 3.8.3 and 3.8.11's built-in libraries, um, having slightly different behavior. And, and so it's things like the version of the language itself that is often not reflected in these dependency trees. Right? And often, but th though absolutely, and that's not true in all cases. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and different ecosystems are quite different in that respect. Uh, for example, typically in a Ruby project, it would be recorded because the tools kind of encourage that. But again, it's ecosystem specific. So is language major and minor release um, version? Well, and language and or language implementation. This is one of the problems for a lot of the projects is that they keep they keep this is a, a, a particularly egregious in the Python world. 
with yeah I, you know I, where the, a lot of people think that c python is the same as python yeah it's not hasn't been for decades yeah. but you know they, Wait, they so, still think that huh i'm gonna try to understand this the language is built in libraries count um so we're counting those as dependencies even though we assume that they're all present because then if, you, if you're using python then is it only dependency if you import it into that particular script or is it are you just assuming that there's dependencies on it like, is you don't want to count the entire python library you only want to count the ones you're actually importing do we care are we saying count the ones that you're importing for your script i think that says the ones we're importing because there is no dependency on the particular built-in libraries if if you're not importing them okay I, there is yeah, a dependency. There wouldn't there, be, but yeah. Well, there, there might be because of transitive dependencies. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, so I, I would say that languages built in libraries are executive dependencies, but are not counted simply because um, you typically just re you know, record that you depend on the language. Yeah. But, I mean, with Python and especially PyPy has been under attack. Uh, DDNS tech for a while now, and Python major releases do matter, and minor releases end up mattering a lot for right. stuff. So knowing the version of Python major and minor is ends up being kind of important for Python developers. I think there's there's also to your point about language implementation, and there's a data science focused implementation of Python package management that is different. Conda um, uh, Anaconda has a Python package manager and release that actually behaves substantially differently in many cases um, than PyPy. So a question for all of you is like, are these the infrastructure libraries? Are these like, because for this metric, we are excluding the infrastructure libraries as a dependency. So are these language built-in libraries are in part of infrastructure or they are like separate libraries we are using in a program? These if they are infrastructure, then we have to exclude it from this metric as we have already defined that we are focused on the school libraries, not the infrastructure libraries. I would think that they're separate. I guess I'm thinking about Python, but most of the packages that I use are function related. So you, you import a series of functions. Mm. But that's that's still not infrastructure. That's just pre-built tooling. Yeah. And I, I think a record of the particular, if, especially for languages like Python that have different package managers and have different um, groups that release it knowing which one can be helpful for understanding different problems that you might encounter. Yeah, I guess the, the major minor release piece. Um, I guess I'm struggling with that because I'm thinking about version inversions as a layer of context on dependencies versus mm -hmm. a count of dependencies. That's so you're trying true. To say you're counting the number of versions. So are we, are we, is the metric to just count or are we enumerating the specific versions? It's just the count and the enumeration of the dependency, but not the version. I, my interpretation was that with the understanding that we're going to have more guidance on applying context to make sense of the enumeration because once you have everything counted it actually it's a big long list and it may or may not be actionable mm -hmm. right yeah <laughs> to make it actionable or knowing okay what where do i have the most dependency or what thing am i depend on the most or what is the most out of date or kind of like identifying what is a higher or lower level risk and to mm -hmm. do that that's sort of part of that the filters that we have here in terms of trends over time, number of versions of for each dependency, multiple references, direct, flat, um, basically all the context that you can use to better enumerate risk versus just account. Okay. 
So I'm not, I'm not sure if, like putting the language implementation here. But that confuses them. Recommending to, but everything else above is a definitive something that we count. The language runtime dependency, the amount right. of in language packages imported. This may be a separate be. metric entirely. Could be. I, I, I see what you're saying. This, this is not coherent with the rest of what has been said. I don't think you should totally scrap it because I think it goes somewhere. It just might not right. Be sure. Yeah, okay. well. Does it go somewhere I, I, in this metric or a different metric? I think it has to be noted in this metric because if you're not counting it, um, uh, I mean, uh, de dependencies required to execute the, the software are execution dependencies. Um, note that certain kinds of dependencies are typically excluded from counts as described below. And you know what, I, how's this? Instead of just eliminating them, why don't we list these as categories of, hmm, these aren't really the parameters. Part of okay, me wants are, to, okay. part of me feels like maybe you, we trim it out and this is a different metric. Um, well, wait a minute. These are parameters. I, don't wanna, I feel of like I'm expanding the scope and creating confusion. Well, the, the problem is if you don't say this, it's ambiguous. Uh, these are basically parameters that explain what you're measuring and not measuring, right? Mm -hmm. Um at least the first two, at least the language rundown dependencies and the libraries, you need to tell whether or not you're including them in the count. Um, yeah, the, the language and language implementation major minor is a different kind of thing. Um, although you could say, does it include the minor, you know, I, I'm I'm wondering if it's like when we talk about infrastructure dependencies, I wonder if it falls into the same category as something like a Docker version or I need a certain database installed. Like if these would be pieces of software or languages loaded on the operate at the operating system level that are just assumed to be there when we do this other counting work. Sophia, what do you think? I'm not sure. I feel like it. It isn't saying that this is to me. This isn't part of infrastructure. It's still language. Okay. But it's. I am agreeing with David that it's kind of. It's not like the rest of the things. I'm kind of. If I remove all the things that we have written, there. If I'm looking at them holistically, they're all things that we can count and definitive categories of things to count. Yeah. Whereas this last one, I'm not really sure what I'm counting. Right, exactly. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's. Yeah, I tried to tweak it to deal with that, but that problem still exists. It's not really a count. I wonder it's, if... it, it's really its own thing. Uh, I think one of the challenges is if you later on, I think the reason it's important is let's say that you wanted to count the built-in libraries and the you know other kinds of runtime dependencies, okay? not knowing the specific version number of the language of the language implementation makes it hard to do that so it, it basically because typically you omit certain information that's not so bad as long as you have this other piece but if you have neither set then th some kind of analysis get really hard i i see what you're saying so you're the way that you're just describing it then that this this point could be made as part of the language's built-in library count. That you're one of the things you're considering is if you're not just counting the libraries, you're counting them as part of a version. Or maybe I'm not understanding it correctly. I, I does this I would assume this metric would tell me the version of each library not only enumerate it, but the dependency includes the name of the library and the version number. Is that fair? 
which it the you know this overall metric overall like if i'm right. counting the dependencies and enumerating them i also need to know the versions and i would count each of the versions because you'd be depending on multiple versions of a library too yeah and so, and so if i'm if i'm depending on versions of a library then at least in the languages i'm familiar with different versions of languages support different versions of libraries that a program depends on which I run into all the time with machine learning and Python. Um, well, hey, careful there. Python actually doesn't allow you to load multiple versions of the same library right. simultaneously. It but, does not. Uh, yeah. and, but Node does. It used to until about six months ago, but yeah. Node, Node still allows it. It may whine no, at you. Python, no, Python no longer. Python screams now, but it didn't used to. Oh, no, 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 no. You're, you're, no uh, that's not what I'm saying. Python used to not scream if the version statements were incompatible. Right. But Python still doesn't let you just load version one and version two of the library simultaneously. Right. No, that's true. Yeah. Node uh, does allow that. There's no reason to worry about incompatible versions because it's all locked. And the problem then is don't worry, you'll load 300 versions of that, including all the vulnerable versions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's no. it's flexible, but it has its downsides. Yeah, but having deployed front ends with Node, I can tell you one of those downsides is stability. <laughs> um, so do we include this or not? It truly is a different thing. Um, can we is there a place to write like note that? Because like, I think it's valuable context, but I don't want to confuse folks when it doesn't fit in in the rest of the format of the metric. So is there a natural place to provide additional context about something? We, we could um, add it under implement, like the implementation we paragraph. Can create a note of this, like as a note, separate note for this. So like at, the, at the bottom, I think, it, it, I mean- At the bottom I, of this yeah. implementation, uh, uh, sorry, at the bottom of parameter, we can create a note of this as a separate bulleted point that I'm okay do, with that. Do we leave it in this format as a note or do we like break it out into a separate I've, paragraph as a note? I think uh, you just break it as a separate paragraph as a note. Just I would say turn that like, thing into a note. Yeah. Note. <laughs> note. And I'll keep it as a bold. Um it is often important to provide uh, at runtime some uh, some um, uh, often uh, language runtimes and built in libraries are omitted see above uh, and this information serves as a shorthand but you know what that's a good point um do we need as a parameter of the version numbers not just the names is that its own i mean because i would want more than a you know you know, are you including all the different versions? How are you counting when there's multiple versions of the same thing? I, I think I think the library I think the version of the library is really important for understanding the the upstream dependencies. Right. So I, how are you how are you capturing that as a parameter here? It's in a it's in filter. As in, sure. like anything can have a version or be attached to a version in terms of what we've enumerated in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in the here. filters, we have number of versions of each dependencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it would be inclusive of the language libraries and other components. <coughs> even, even the next point is multiple references to the same dependencies. So I, th uh, I think maybe something under parameters where all we say uh, something like 
I, I, th I think all enumerated dependencies should include this specific version. Well, like, it's not, like it's not terribly useful to me if I know what library I'm dependent on, but I don't know which version of it. Yeah. Well, and the, and the trick there is uh, a lot of systems will record, you know, they don't record, pin this is one of the arguments about pinning. A lot of systems record like a version range, but don't pin it to a ver particular version number. There's no pinning to a particular version number. Could it be should include versus will include? Is this is a recommendation? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> I can make it shall and get really legalistic about it. <laughs> no, shall is a requirement. Should is a should. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we, I have lived that game. Shall and will are, are two words that I am that are burned in my mind. There's a big difference in the law for those two. There is. There's even a court <laughs> case about it. Yeah. Evil court. Yeah. <laughs> will is a hope and you, you don't have to do it shall is enforceable as hell <laughs> right all right so added that uh, probably this isn't plural I like the educational value of yeah. explaining these different types of dependencies with mm -hmm. visualizations. That's very helpful, I think. Yeah. I don't know what flat dependencies means. So uh, the only thing I would say is you're saying direct dependencies. You say, you know, our project goes A, A and C in terms of self-explanatory, but the transitive one, you could say, I, I think it might be useful to say, you know, C is a transitive dependency of our project or something like that, or to make that explicit. Okay. Because you could be talking about B to C relationships and things like that too, but not now. So, so in the transitive dependency, uh, I have explained this in an example. Uh, I'm highlighting this, for example, this, yeah. this oh. portion. If you go to the very top of the parameters, I've selected a paragraph Parameter. that explains this. Yep, this one, the one yeah, I've selected. Okay. okay, for example. Uh... So flat dependencies then is the only one that we don't have to find where we have direct to find circular, we have an image of, but it's not written in the depth one. <laughs> it's more that we're not being consistent about what we're calling and then what we're defining. Well done, Sophia. Yep. Yeah, I'm a little Good confused. Point. Um, Thank you for that pointing me to the paragraph. You know, I'm sorry. I uh, sorry I had to join late, but if you could put a link to this document, I'll. So maybe I defined circular dependency oh, yeah. yep. here. Sorry. Uh, well, that's good. Don't uh, don't. I, you... I have to just you know because I'm. David, can you just do it since so we don't disrupt the flow? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Do do. I just did it. Oh, you did it. Okay. Okay. Right, thanks. Thanks. So there's something enumerated up here that is not in the images below. That's, or there's. So the circular dependency is in the image, but not explained over here. Yeah. Okay. And I think the other one you said was flat dependencies. Yeah, it's listed and then not visualized or explained. I didn't even know. I don't even know what a flat dependency I'm is. I'm not sure either, which is why I brought it up. <laughs> Where is the flat dependency in this? Uh, it's under filters. Under filters, okay. I don't know either flat dependencies. I you could kill it if nobody knows what it means. And yep. I I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a Google. I'm gonna do a quick Google search here. <laughs> uh, flat depend flat dash dependencies is an NPM resolve all the projects flat dependencies. Interesting. Um, it sounds like a functional implementation of resolving dependencies more than a type of dependency. All right, I see I see how one uses it. It's wonderful because it doesn't define its term. It assumes you know what it is already. Glorious. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, all right, uh, okay, assuming you already know what it is. Ah, how does NPM3 decide how to install flat versus nested? Uh, 
So here is the link I have posted for the flood dependencies in the reference. If you will click on the link I have provided, this is a diagram of the flood dependencies. So now flood dependency is, is, I think that what they're defining is um, direct dependencies is what they're calling flood yeah, dependencies. Uh, I'm not, actually, I, th I think it's just naming. It's, it's, it's how you do the naming constructs. Uh, let's see here. Well, if you look, there's a universal dependencies that are going to talk about flat for multi word expressions. So it's talking about in the context of words. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah. that would make sense to me if it's like mathematically, instead of saying I depend on function X, you define function X. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's basically listing everything in itself versus linking it out to separate things. So it can be the same dependency. You can just explicitly be spelled out in it versus linking to it. So that's how I would, that's how I would mathematically interpret it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's in line. Oh, with no, 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 no. Okay, this is, okay. Flat yeah. dependencies, a Node.js package originator that supports flat directory structures. In other words, um, it's it's a uh, how you organize the naming and which I don't think we care about. I don't think is we it, care about. Let's just delete it. Yeah, I delete it. Because yeah, I think it's the same as direct, but some some nuanced thing. Well, actually, we... no. It's it's not necessarily the same as direct, and it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah. that, the doesn't matter the doesn't matter part is what I'm gonna love about that. That's right. Uh, <laughs> That's right. I mean, it, ma it matters from an implementation point of view, but what we're worried about is that's, we're not worried about the naming. We just want to know, are you including everything you depend on, direct and indirect? Are we, is it, yeah, and is everyone comfortable with, quite frankly, um, transitive being considered a nested dependency? Because that's the other term that gets thrown around. I certainly, I know, I, I have heard the term many times. Um, I prefer transitive because I think that's clearer. I, I, I'm, uh, fine, I'm fine with that, us being using the dominant term being transitive, but do we want to make sure it's explicit that there's a synonym of nested? It's What's usually that? a synonym of nested. Um, it can be, it, it, it can be talking about the naming construct instead of the, um, uh, instead of whether or not they're transitive. That's one of the reasons I prefer transitive because you can, some people mean other things. Yeah. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. I would just say, this is what we mean by transitive. And if you use another term, that's fine, but that's not, if we don't use another term, then we don't have to be confusing about it. <laughs> then we should remove, because we had circular slash nested dependencies. So I think- yeah, yeah, just call them circular because nested dependencies don't have to be circular. Yeah. So what will be the definition of circular dependency? I recommend the usual uh, usual definition, circular dependencies, colon, C, circular dependencies. <laughs> <laughs> you're just, you're, you're, now, now you're just being mean, David. <laughs> I don't love it. I kind of it. I think it says it all. <laughs> I, I I can't I I I'm actually I'm only joking, but I'm not the first to say this because in fact uh, I think the Devil's Dictionary did that hundreds of years ago. So um, uh, let's see here: circular dependencies are dependencies which, when traced, end up back at themselves. Can end up back at themselves. Can we define that? Where where do we define these things? So we are under filters or elsewhere? Uh, no, in the parameters uh, under this. Uh, is it a parameter? I don't see parameters. Uh, I have selected the text circular dependency where we have to define this term. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Dependent uh, uh, dependencies where if traced uh, eventually lead uh, uh, um, eventually lead back to themselves. Good okay. Yep. Now, and and, and uh, I, I I think basically we we I think we should assume that in systems we that allow this, um, a dependency is only 
counted once. Hmm. In systems that allow circular dependencies, we assume that a given dependency is only counted once, right? Is that yeah. fair enough? Yeah. Okay, as declared in the source code and or package uh, and or package. Um, I mean, what would you call the uh, package managers and or package manager configuration? E.g. Oh, requirements.txt, gem file, et cetera. Yep. yep. Actually, the um, there's a the auger file this model as well, but um, the down here at the bottom, the libraries.io has a something called biblio the carry, which I'm not I'm not sure what that word means, but it actually will scan all of the different ways that dependencies can be identified in different languages. And there's like four different ways in Python. Yeah. And, and they address them all. So I think that was a nice advance from the previous work I'd seen that they did. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I'm, does it, uh, is there anything else we should discuss here or do we want to uh i think this looks good if if you all are okay then i can proceed with the release of this metric i'm good okay. <clears throat> i mean i'm sure all these things can always be improved <laughs> yeah that's and that's that's where it's uh, i think it, it, i guess it feels like it's at that stage where we send it out to the community and wait for them to tell us what yep. needs to change Okay. So, Vinod, okay. you'll handle that action yes, item? Yes, I'll, I'll take it as an action item and I'll uh, create the release for this. Uh, let me double check on one thing that we talked about earlier. If we have multiple versions of the same dependency within, is that considered multiple? Is that considered one? How are we handling that again? I need to go back. I want to look I think in language thing. that allows, in languages that they allow multiple versions, to be included, then I would think each version would be a dependency. Or at least, well, or at least make sure that's a, that's a, param I would say at least make sure that's a parameter, but I don't see that. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. So uh, I don't so see if any. If you look at the filters, number of versions of each dependency. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah. But, but I, I think it's different. Some systems, you may just count it once they end and you don't get the version numbers. Mm. So it's not really a filter so much as a parameter. Do you get the, uh, you know, you do get the specific versions and how do you count them? I mean, I... Yeah, these aren't really quite filters. They're more like labels. Um, let's see. If we're being, yeah. kidding, the first one is also yeah. not the rest of them. Yeah. So time is a common filter in our metrics. Oh, so it's time. Okay. So time. Number of versions. I don't know how that's a filter. I agree. I, it, it's probably the wrong word. It's a, yeah, they're it's not a, really I, filters. They're more like they're add-ons. Because if we look at the the list of parameters are the things that we're counting. And then this is a list of things that augment the count or like basically second order variables that you've attached to anything you're counting. These are kind of attributes of, of the metric. Like historically we haven't needed to specify the attributes, but I think, I think actually that's what the, these are. They're like, this is the data that you need to have a dependency so, you know, so yeah. looking at this, I think we just keep first parameter trained over time and delete uh, all five because we have already explained them in the parameters. Like uh, we have we, for these, we could kill so, that because those are defined. I am thinking of deleting these five. And we have number of dependent. 
I think I agree with it. Virgins at the beginning, and then the last one. Yeah, oh. I mean, that, I, I would agree. Deleting the last three is fine. Okay. Uh, the other, the other two, the of uh, uh, the version stuff. That's first of I all. Think... I, I don't. I, I does anybody care about multiple references to the same dependency? It's I mean, more is that... about as a risk parameter. If you depend mm -hmm. on something once versus ten times, I'm assuming that should change how you prioritize keeping it up to date. <laughs> How many, yeah, how many, it, it is an important piece of information, how many, and I guess the only question I have is if that's, I mean, it's important. I need, okay, like, so, so it's I really care not, more of, because so it helps me make decisions about what upstream projects I contribute to. So it's really the question of the number of references, not just whether there are multiple references. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, okay. I, I guess I can mm -hmm. see if, if filter is really more information. Uh, but this, the other question still is more than just number of versions for each dependency. I'm thinking that actually also, maybe that's okay as a filter, but I think it also goes up as a parameter. Do you get yeah, information is, about, yeah. where, okay, where is that? Where you um, get the I think versions Sean for added it right under the parameters, all the way at the top of the parameters. Oh yeah, it's the paragraph I, I put Yeah, in. the first one. All enumerated dependencies should include a specific dependency version that is used. Yeah, the so specific the specific versions of uh, uh, that is used for each Our dependencies, case. right? Yeah. Does that cover what you were indicating? Uh, I mean, at least it's it's noting that, uh, but we're still not figuring out whether or not do we count different depend different versions of a dependency once or multiple times. I uh, think so. I think that belongs. Uh, leave the paragraph, but I think that needs to be added as a parameter. Is the how do you handle counting multiple versions? I mean, I think they all should be counted separately. If they're different versions, that means they're mm -hmm. out of sync. Yep. Yeah, I need to know my, that I depend on those two versions or 11 ver I need to know, I need an enumeration of every version of a library I depend on. I, yeah, so I'm not so sure how many tools actually do that. Kate, do you have any better better sense for that? So if, if I end it at the bottom, multiple versions of uh, same library. Well, I would say are multiple versions, are, are multiple versions of the same Dependency counted different uh, count uh, dependency counted independently. I would say we would assert not the question, but just yep. take multiple versions of of the same dependency are counted independently. Yeah, I would say to do it that way too. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, and I don't have a good stat for you. Sorry, David, um, but it's a pretty common pattern. All right, so so um, so you want the default to be yes, but at least give people the option because I think for a lot of these tools, the answer is no. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. We could just let it, let them decide. I mean, if we, like, we can define the metric and then people can, well, I, okay. I, I think, I think, you know, this is an element of where, you know, in the software build materials, you would basically make sure you separated them out. Yeah. I'd want to know. And I think so. So, I think we should say that this is what we want measured that we think is the metric and tools. I th ultimately, if tools aren't providing that today, I think they will catch up mm -hmm. because this is important. Yeah. Because you have a vulnerability in one version and not in the other. Surprise, All right. Surprise. So um, we're at time and this is great that we can release a metric. I feel like a very productive working meeting. Um, I, I have, uh, unfortunately, neither of the proposals that we made for um, Open Source Summit were accepted. And I believe I am responsible for that uh, because when I went back and looked, I pasted the wrong description. I, I reversed the descriptions that I pasted. Oh, no. And I believe that anybody who read what I submitted would have been completely confused. And I don't know how I did that, but I think we did not get accepted because I messed up. And so I apologize.
I, I will quickly note that um, although we don't know the answers yet, uh, I'm on the program committee for the Linux Security Summit, and we had a crazy large number of submissions. Mm -hmm. And so you could have done everything right and still not been accepted simply because there's just so much and something had to be, get dropped. So yeah. it may not have a, anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad. I, I feel bad about it because I think the work that we've done is here is is really kind of important and hasn't been done elsewhere. And so that's why uh, I feel bad and I'm sorry. If you want to brush up a version, mm -hmm. okay, of what we really want to talk about, forward it to me. And if there's something that drops, I'll see if I can get it inserted in one of the as a waitlist type of topic. Okay, I will. I will. Uh, I will send. I don't know. I, I, there's no guarantees. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, hey. there's, there's a bunch of stuff on waitlist, but I can at least put it forward. It's it's like being in the, it's like being in the um, intensive care. You have the possibility that you might live, as opposed to actually being dead. So <laughs> I'll take intensive care. <laughs> <laughs> but, but polish it up well, so that we can just go full yeah. in. If okay. I can see if, the, if, um, if there's an opportunity. All right, I'll I'll do that. I'll do that today because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm afraid I wasn't looking. I wasn't. Uh, this one wasn't on one of the tracks I was reviewing. So yeah, okay. I will send that to you uh, today. Meaning like yeah, like uh, five yeah, or I, six. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I'd say you know, understanding where the dependabilities are and risk and so forth can potentially fit under the dependability track. But okay. um, I don't know if I'll have any openings there, and I'll see if there's maybe on the wild card or something like that. All right, I'll I'll send you the polished up versions of that. It'll be easier than submitting the form to the LF anyway. Um, I just got a notification that the open source strategy forum extended their deadline. Ah, okay. it was due last week, and I like started one and then never did it, and I was like, I already have four talks this fall. Do I really want another one? Um, <laughs> but it, it's it's focused on financial services i was partially interested in it because there's one in new york and it'd be nice for me to meet some local folks that yeah. are in the space but if i did end up submitting a talk it probably would be more on the risk side just because i think there's more interest in financial services and risk management in open source like i just feel like that topic is more appealing than not just how do you understand communities through metrics which is kind of what my other topics have been so I'll let you know if I do, if there's opportunity for a panel or something like that, I'll reach out to this group. I don't actually really know. I haven't, again, I opened it and then never filled it out. So I have another but day. now you have a chance. <laughs> I um, know, it's like, it's like, I get a, I get a second chance here, but. And if, 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 if you do want to meet, I'll, I'll tell you this, if you want to, I used to live in Philly. If you want to meet, fin, meet FinTech people in New York, the R user group there has all of the hedge fund people and the quants that are on wall street that just flock to it it's like 150 people every month i don't and, i don't, think I don't care about fincer it's more that i'm interested in the uh, local open source community in new york i just feel like yeah. my network and contacts are west <laughs> right yeah 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 okay thank you all for a very productive meeting but thanks for throwing out the um release process for this metric and uh, we'll pick a metric and run with it next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And, bye. And bye.